Our special guest, Paola Salvatore, is synonymous with a very, very important part in the history of recorded music. I'm talking about the famed Capitol Studios. She has a very impressive career in the recording industry. She's currently the vice president of Capitol Studios there in Hollywood. And she has some fascinating stories. She has been called the smart, vivacious, the funny Pella Salvatore. I'm very honored to have you with us. I'm extremely honored um, to be asked to do this interview. Um, and uh, I've seen your interviews. I've, I love the one you did with Al Schmidt. And I'm so happy that Robert Davi uh, put us together. Um, I do want to update my new title. All right. Um, effective uh, earlier this year. Um, uh, UMG elevated me to uh, vice president of client relations and studio marketing across their uh, U.S. facilities, which includes Capitol. Um, there's a new Santa Monica soundstage that's just come up in, in Santa Monica across the street from Universal Music Group. And the um, new facilities that was the House of Blues in Nashville, and now it is called East Iris, and it's a, it's a combination of a lot of little cute studios, uh, good for recording, uh, project studios, everything. So, Well, congratulations. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I think since your background is musical, it would be helpful for us to know about your early experiences with music, the stuff that you were listening to on the radio or recordings, what was the stuff that you loved early on? Well, that uh, very, very, very early into music and interested into music. And I saw someone playing the piano and I loved it. But of course, uh, the Beatles, you know, I was really little and fell in love with the Beatles and Paul McCartney and, and that started it. But then, you know, as I was uh, growing up, I was... Um, given this little Magnus chord organ that's like 15 keys and push button chords. And I started playing along with the radio and the first song was I'm a believer by the monkeys. So started really listening to music and trying to identify how, how do they layer that stuff? I don't even know, but um, I did uh, request a piano of my dad, which was, you know, uh, Italian family with five kids and he wasn't really going to go out and get me a piano, but, he ended up getting me a sewing machine. So <laughs> set me on a different course, but I was always into music. Just loved it. Just loved all kinds of music. The radio, you know, radio and records, just always right there with me. And what about your parents? Were they at all musical people? Well, they did love music, but they weren't, it wasn't a priority with them. Um, my mom was uh, very young, started having kids, and she was a wonderful homemaker and cook. My dad loved to, to draw and paint, but uh, he became an insurance man um, because you had to get a job quick, and being an artist wasn't going to make him money back then. So they, they were not, but they always, um, they always encouraged me um, with my music. They kind of just thought it was cute for a while, too, you know, that I said that the main thing I want to do is play piano and sing. And then my dad goes, but what really do you want to do? And I said, that's it, <laughs> you know? Hmm. So, but since, you know, I, I excelled really good with sewing. I had an aunt that sewed and, and um, I um, figured, well, I got to figure out how I'm going to get into music with this. So I went on a, to Boston with my brother. He was looking at um, some schools and, you know, I was still in high school and I found um, a college that was right near Berkeley School of Music. And I said, aha, I'll make the clothes for the bands. I'll do the rock band clothing. So, cause I had a lot of experience sewing, you know? So they, they did encourage me, but they were, my dad mostly, he was very frugal and very worried that I was just gonna, you know, go into this crazy business and uh, you know, get in trouble or whatever. But, you know, he got a chance to see it, that I did well, happy to say. And this background in making clothes, would you say that it has made you more aware of how important, perhaps, style, image is when someone is a recording artist? Yes. For um, performance, you know, I think you have to have the whole package and that just adds to it. And of course, I grew up when Cher was on, uh, you know, the TV and just 
I said, I got to meet Bob Mackey, but just the, especially, you know, women always knew how to dress and it was that, that period of time that they extravagance was great. Uh, but I also saw men needed, needed fashion. You know, I think men could, you know, ramp it up a bit and, uh, and especially, um, when men started wearing groups started wearing flowing clothes like Mick Jagger and everything. I, I got to meet Mick Jagger very early, like when I was in college, just by a fluke in Boston. And I just checked out his clothes and said, this is good. I could make these. So, you know, I, I, I got some early inspiration. So it did. It taught me a lot about style and taught me a lot about patience and, you know, and, and, you know, being steadfast and doing a job good. Hmm. Well, I have to say this scarf is just a wonderful, it, it just gives you the, just the right, it gives just the right amount of color. You're so nice. Thank you so much. First so, time. <laughs> what's that? I said, the first time I put it out, I just thought, oh, let me, you know, spice it up a little bit on camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to put you on the spot here then. Who have you seen walking through the the hallways of Capitol Studios that you thought this might be the most stylish person I've seen here? Style uh, in the studio. Of course, Lady Gaga, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> you can't, uh, beat her when she walks in every day it is. Um, I met, I saw Dolly Parton walk in and I was mystified by her. She was, it's like a movie coming at you. She was so coiffed and everything was perfect. And, um, you know, Tom Petty always used to dress nice when, you know, he, he came in mostly for a, a Hollywood star ceremonies. But I just noticed that he dressed really nice. And the funny thing that when I first came to L.A., the first job I ever had being a seamstress was at the store called Granny Takes a Trip on Sunset. It was right next door to the Roxy. And come to find out many years later, he was Tom Petty's uh, clothing designer hmm not funny yeah i'm yeah. suit maker and everything yeah you've been witness to the making <laughs> of so many recordings your yeah. job being at this place where so many great recordings legendary have happened and continue all the time what do you think it what's the element what makes for a really great recording in your opinion well i think it's um preparedness first of all um i think that's really going to be an important thing i think you have a good positive energy with with all the members of the band and and keep that while you're in the studio of course the song is the number one hmm. song songs are number one and i think that's why i say preparation is really good because you should be ready to do the songs when you're coming in and um then uh a, a, a talented uh, lead vocalist, of course, talented band too. But I just think you have to have a really uh, positive energy and know that you're going to create something magical. What would you say is the atmosphere or what would you say is the mood that you're trying to set? Somebody comes to Capitol Studios there. Uh, wh what are you trying to achieve with the, the atmosphere there? You know, first of all, totally... Um, hospitality is hmm. number one um and uh i i always and i worked at sound city for nine years too but i always wanted to make it a very friendly atmosphere sort of like a concierge at a hotel like a technical hotel or um you know just just having when people come in make them feel like you're joining a family and we're all interested in the same thing and making you have the most amazing uh, music come out of it with the technology and the um, hospitality we can create. So hmm. friendliness is one of the main things. I always wanted people to feel like you're coming to my house and, and would love having you here, like a restaurant, you know, concert, maitre d' at a restaurant. Make people feel special. When people go into Capitol Studios, I'm sure there's this feeling of reverence, excitement. I've never been inside, but just seeing it from the outside, you know, made my heart kind of beat faster. What about for you? This is where you work. You, you go in, how would you describe, what does it feel like to walk into 
the famed Capitol Studios building? You know, you 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 take a breath and you go, ah, and you see the pictures on the wall and you you realize the history that you're walking into. And, um, you know, it's it affects everybody that way. They really feel it, the building, the vibe. I mean, even Sting, the first time he came in, he said, I've always marveled at this building from afar. <laughs> I said, well, marvel no more, you're here. <laughs> and even uh, Bono and... Uh, we've worked with Justin Hurwitz, who was Academy Award winner for La La Land. And he said, I've always looked at this building um, and watched it. I'm so happy to be here. So yeah, I, I guess it, it's just an icon of musical legends. That's what that building and you feel it when you walk in. You were mentioning earlier the, the late Al Schmidt. And that's just mm -hmm. a name that will endure forever in in the history and in, in the world of recorded music. Can you recall the first time you met Al Schmidt? Sure. Um, he he came in to check on um, doing the Natalie Cole Unforgettable album, and that was in uh, February of 1991. Um, I had heard of him, of course, and stuff, but uh, always was a little curious because I hadn't met him. I was in a different mode at Sound City with different, you know, heavy metal guys and stuff. So meeting Al was uh, the, the, the class of a man that he was. Um, he was um, he was amazing and nice to me. Um, just happy to be there. His positive energy was profound. And the way he took time with people and just kept the smile going on, um, he he was just amazing to work with, and he did that every day that he came in, and and I I spent you know almost thirty years with him, so I was really honored uh, to be to have that chance to live that history with him, and learn live his experience with him, and be an integral part of booking those sessions for him. And I used to sometimes get calls from people who wanted to you know do big band and stuff, and I said, do you know about Al Smith? And they're like, oh gosh, yes, and I'm like. Well, I could see if he's a bit available because <laughs> yeah. I always wanted to keep Al around because Al was the spirit of the place. He he just uh, kept everybody going and um, he would keep his doors open and let people visit as much as they wanted to and just give everybody the time to feel special about being with him. Hmm. He was amazing. I love him so much and I miss him every single day. There are things he said in that interview I haven't I haven't listened to that in years and I still remember things that he said like he was saying look if you're going to go to the recording studio or whatever you're doing if your job is just to sweep do a great job sweeping if you're if you're supposed to make the coffee make the best coffee and it, I'm hoping you can tell us who, about the heart of Al Schmidt who was this man yeah. Um, you know, he was uh, a one of a kind, special person. He had a beautiful gift, but he nurtured that gift from a very young age. You know, he he's a strong uh, pursuer of passion. And that's where he leads all these students and people trying to make a go of it. He said, follow your passion. And like you said, do it the best you can. Know that every step is a, a step into the right direction of fulfilling that dream you have. And he I mean, even up to in his late 80s, he, he still had that integrity and that work ethic that he 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 just came in with a good attitude, uh, always there to help and uh, just said, let's do a wonderful job together. He used to kid around and say, I lie. I told my wife I'm coming to work because <laughs> he just loved uh, being social with everybody. You know, I could go into into his room and say, hey, there's a tour with these students next door. Would you come over? You're like, yeah, Put his hands together and uh, just come on over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was he was amazing. I, you know, I never pictured my life without him. You know, mm -hmm. I always thought I'm going to stay until Al goes, you know, and um, he's just been an integral part of my career. He's been an integral part of my uh, sustaining my career and uh, you know just bless me with with a positive um, energy and support and loyalty. Uh, I'm 
I'm the most blessed person in the world besides his wife and family, you know, but I, I really think that he was a amazing man. And I think he almost kept going for all the community. You know, he, he, he said, I'm going to go until I can't because he kept us all going. No one could complain about their aches and pains when it, when they were around Al, <laughs> cause he mm. ran circles around everybody. And what an incredible impression he's made, not only on personal levels, but just, gosh, what a, I mean, so many credits you could never, you know, you could never touch it all. That was what was hard about interviewing him. It, it just is a well that keeps going. I mean, even now I keep reading and I'm like, oh my God, I almost, you know, I realize a lot and I've studied them a lot, but it was just kept going. And I read his book off, off the record, um, on the record, sorry. <laughs> And um, it, it tells of his whole life. And, you know, he's he's like six decades of mm. musical history. Yeah. God bless him. And there are so many very, very celebrated producers who have worked there at Capitol Studios. When I talk about great producers, who comes to your mind? Um, I would say Phil Ramone. Um, just watching him work, um, bless his soul. Uh, Tommy LaPuma as well, um, who did so many records with Al. They were booked in almost like every year. And the Diana Krall records, the Paul McCartney records. And um, also, um, I, I always thought uh, David Foster, a uh, superstar. Um, uh, Burt Bacharach, he's an amazing producer. When, um, just so many projects he's worked on. I think uh, like, Ted Templeman's a great producer. It's just, uh, you know, those are the initial bunch that comes to mind. But uh, there's so many up and coming producers now. I mean, the talent is really endless. One artist that I'm sure is on everybody's mind is the great Frank Sinatra, who will always <laughs> be associated with Capital. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about your interaction with him? Was that something, was, was that kind of, Something that made you nervous to be in his presence? Um, I wasn't. I, I wasn't as nervous because I feel an affinity towards artists and and making them smile. So I wasn't. I was more nervous of, um, you know, they they were saying like, uh, please don't approach Sinatra. Please don't, you know, uh, go up to him. Don't don't ask for this or that. And so that was more nervous because of my instinct and tendency was to go hi <laughs> and so so when um he he came in and he didn't like the setup and we had to change it all and he kind of left in a huff and then he ended up coming back of course and history was made phil phil got him back and everything was fine but um you know i i no one really approached him in the hall but one day i was walking up the hall in front of him and he was going to go the wrong way. And his manager said, go that way up the hall. And he's, he said, follow that, huh? And I'm like, oh, I, did I just hear that? Okay. So when he got to the top of the hall, when I got to the top of the hall, I waited. And I said, hello, Mr. Sinatra. My name is Paula. Uh, I wanted to meet you. And he said, oh, so nice to meet you. I'm going to have to come back and sing another day. And I'm like, oh, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was uh, that day. And it was, uh, it was a few days of it, but it was the world. I just wrote in the book, it's Frank's world. We just live in it. We were just, you know, there for him. <laughs> what did you find him to be like? I found it to be um, pretty, pretty normal. Like hmm. he, you know, he had his members only jacket on. He came down to sing. He hadn't been in the studio in a lot of years. So he was a little, um, had a lot of anticipation. So, but he, once he got in the room and he, he wanted to be in the main room, he didn't want to wear headphones. He had a handheld mic. He wanted it and he wanted to be near his um, piano player, Billy. So as long as he was comfortable and they said, you know, get him this and that little, you know, things he liked to munch on and stuff. He seemed comfortable and he was so nice to Al. I mean, Al was so excited to work with him and he came in the control room after it and, and, and laugh with Al and Phil. It was, uh, he seemed at his, in his element. <laughs> mm -hmm. And 
One of the fun things about doing this interview is I got to do a lot of research. I listened to pretty much every interview that you've done, which there's a lot of them. And yeah. uh, th there's a great story. One of the things that you can put on your resume, a claim to fame, is that Frank Sinatra kissed you. <laughs> is that true? It is. It is true. I've, I've, uh, it's one of the proudest moments, I would say. But um, a few days later after I met him, uh, Hank Catania, who's, God bless him, he is still, I think he's in uh, Palm Springs or Vegas, I don't know. But he was Frank's main guy, you know, at his side at all times. And um, he came in the next day and he gave me a hug and he kept, he hung, he hung on to me and he said, I got to, he goes, Frank. I got to introduce you to um, Paula. And I, I looked at him, I go, I met you, the, I met you the other day, but I didn't tell you my last name was Salvatore. And while I was saying that, he put his hand under my chin and he said, I remember, I won't forget that face. And just came at me. It was like slow motion, gave me a kiss right on the lips. And it, I, every, I went into a daze. <laughs> because all I could think of was his blue eyes are so blue. His I, I was lost in his eyes. I got to say it, you know, and, and then he went down the hall singing, everybody loves somebody, the Dean Martin song. So I was like, I was on a cloud. I'm like, look at these lips. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. That, that's an incredible claim to fame. I know. Oh, <laughs> It was, I was very blessed. Oh. Uh -huh. Well, as you were mentioning at the beginning, the person who brought us together, a very great singer, a great actor, Robert Davi. And I'm hoping he, he has worked there at Capitol Studios, including just yes. recently. Can you recall meeting Robert Davi? Yes, yes. How could you not? <laughs> <laughs> um, Dina Martin... Uh, was having a re record release party. It was in her honor, and she had Dennis Farina. She had, like, all the guys, Jill Montagna and Robert Davi. And uh, I, he had he has such a good countenance on his face and smiling on his face. And, and I met him and introduced myself, and I said, I, he goes, oh, I got to work here. And I said, I would love you to, you know. So let's let's plan a lunch in another day. So... Uh, we just made good friends that that night, and then he came in, and and I said, you know, uh, guess who's in is a Frank Sinatra's producer and engineer, you know, Phil Ramone and Al Schmidt, and uh, he's like, oh, I'd love to meet them, so called down there and made sure it's okay to bring them in, and him and Phil, then Al walked in, and they were like three buddies right from the start. Uh, he, him and Phil loved each other. You could tell they had so much history being from New York, and and Al too. And um, it was it was just remarkable, and he he had some mixes left to do, so he he wanted Alan um, Phil's name on it and their um, you know talent. So um, it was great. We got to work together, and uh, I've always uh, so encouraged him with his singing career. I think he's amazing, and his um, performances are so uh, they're so fun. It's such a good band, such good music. He has a great voice and he does that style so well. He fits it. Perfect. Yeah. I really like him. Me too. Yeah. Uh, that, that album that he made yeah. 10 years now on the road yeah. to romance. Yep. Yep. It's so interesting to me because I mean, I think of a lot of, a lot of people who sing those songs and a lot of times yeah. It's like, don't just try to copy Frank Sinatra. And he doesn't do that. It's really, it's his no. own take. He has the dulcet tones. He has that, but he, he makes his own style. And he has comedy with them. Have you seen the show live? I did, yes. Yeah, it's so fun. Yeah, he's he's uh, he has so much charisma. And uh, it was great to have him in the studio recently. He was singing again. And I said, your voice sounds amazing. You yeah. really do. Yeah, I'm so happy for him. I'm so happy he's following his his dream. You know, he's he's a wonderful guy. He, there's nothing pompous or arrogant about him. He's so um, approachable and friendly. Yeah, he's a true, true friend, as you know, like you. Mm. 
he, last night he sent me a couple of the the unmixed uh, tracks that he recorded there at Capitol Studios, and I was oh. walking along, and I had my headphones on. I was listening, and I just started getting misty eyed. I was just so touched oh. by his by the, his approach, his sensitivity for being yeah. this tough guy. <laughs> Yeah, isn't it? I know. Yeah. That's it. That's his style. Yeah. Thank you, Robert, for um, introducing me to Paul. And I, you know, I love the interview you did with Al. I sent it over to Lisa. She loved it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, for a lot of people who are big band singers or interpreters of the American Songbook, if you're going to make a recording, capital, if you know, that's the place to do it. What do you think about the American songbook? What, what are your feelings about these classic songs? Um, I don't think they really ever grow old. I think it's uh, something that each generation will grow to um, admire and uh, try to put their little bent on it. Um, I, I, you know, why in that period did, were those songs so special? You know, they, they kind of, because they were fresh and creative, and um, it, it just established uh, America's sound. And, um, you know, they, they evoke your imagination, um, dreams. It, it was, I guess it was just an innocent time. And they, I think there was like a, a, like a, a cloud atmosphere of a gift of writing music. I mean, look at Henry Mancini, look at these artists, and look at these songs. Um, how come it's hard to write them now? You know, they captured, mm. as Tom Petty says, they captured lightning in a bottle. Mm. It's, it's, they're, they're very, they're very special. And I, we don't get tired of them. You, you know, people, so many people came into Capitol going, this is where they were made. This is where I want to do it. But they still sound good. You like hearing those horns and strings and rhythm. Yeah. So much fun. You have said in, in interviews, I've heard where you said that capital is a place where really it's a versatile place. You can let your imagination run wild. There's all kinds of things. It's not just strictly you go there to sing and, and record. One yeah. singer, you, you were mentioning that the Beatles were what you were listening to early on. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Paul McCartney a few years back. He made this Kisses on the Bottom album, singing these classics. And then he did something really cool, I thought. Paul McCartney, live at Capitol, which people can, if you, if you haven't heard those, you they were released as recordings. Yes. Do you have any memories of that experience? Oh, embedded in my soul. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was an amazing time. It was the top of the year. He had come in to do stuff and they're going to have a week rehearsal. We had just finished renovating our console. So it was so stressful to get everything. I mean, had, they were guys under the console. Our kiln was uh, spearheading that. And it was right to the pop, right to the dot. And Al going, are we ready? We're ready. So they did rehearsals all week. And uh, Paul was in every day. He was elated. It was the, the thought of going live to iTunes was like, uh, panicking. I think I was praying every day in advance, <laughs> you know, and um, he, uh, they decided to give Paul a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame on that same Friday. Friday night was the, was, was a live show, but Friday at noon, they decided to give him um, a star outside. And it, so that was just kind of a last minute call. It was so much pandemonium and so many people Everybody wanting to, to meet him, but all he wanted to do was go back in the studio and wait for this, you know, uh, show to begin. And then it was like, uh, you know, they had an invited audience, limited. Uh, we were ready to go live. I sat on the couch in front of the console and just said, oh, God, please let everything go well. Let everything go well. You know, it's like it's enjoyment and stress at the same time. But it's like the best kind of stress. And, and Al made it sound so good. And it was that's why I really believe in live, live, you know, so much of everything as they say it's live, but it's, you know, pre-recorded as you know, but, but this was live. And Paul said, I want to start again. You know, it was released as a, a as a video and it won um, a Grammy for best video that year, that year, live kisses. And so I suggest people watch or listen, whichever one they prefer, because 
what yeah. a special musical it artifact. It, it is beautiful. The way um, having worked with uh, Diana Krall in the studios and just really a special touch. Uh, and Paul, these were songs that Paul loved when he was growing up. So it was, it was really special. Yeah. Uh, that was like uh, the most amazing time. But, but my, uh, I had known, I, I met Paul a lot at the studios and stuff, but that week was like, I, my cup runneth over of Paul McCartney. I was like, all right, he is amazing. And he is so nice. Him and Al got along so well. Um, and uh, he, he just loves what he do, does. And he loves people that love it too. It's amazing, hmm. man. Amazing. Well, on that note, you said he was so nice. Who, who would you say is the nicest person that has come to Capitol Studios? Besides Al Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Paul, uh, James Taylor ah. is amazing. I mean, Sting is, is cool. Um, so many, oh God, I mean, so many. You must, there's a plethora of artists that are nice. But, you know, I, I would probably say more, there's less not nice people. Mm. Because, um when people come down the halls and they smile and it's like, like, is life that bad that you're here and you're going in and you're seeing all these major influences on your life as you walk down the hall and you're going to go in and record and sing on some of the same mics that Sinatra sang on or Nat King Cole. And, you know, Natalie Cole was a beautiful, nice person. Diana Krall. I mean, they're, they're so polite and so loving and, and, um, you know, and I even met Barbara Streisand down there. She was nice. Never mind all the people that are involved around people, managers and, and, their en and engineers. But, you know, it's like you, it's not hard to tap into that beautiful energy and, and smile and, and greet people and give them a hug and say, welcome back. You know, it, it's, it's a happy event. So try to make sure people want to be nice, you know. Hmm. Encourage, encourage that. <laughs> you mentioned James Taylor a second ago, and it seems like I've noticed that if if somebody keeps making recordings, if you keep making records, eventually, all great singers they all make an American Songbook album. Mm -hmm. you, you get around to the standards eventually, and James Taylor has done that now. And tell tell us about. What did you think of these uh, the these recent interpretations that he did? I think the album was called American Standard. Yeah, yeah. I think he might have won a Grammy. Almost. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, he has the, the charming voice and a spirit that he could do anything, but I think it's nice, his rendition of it. Um, the same for Bob Dylan, uh, coming in and doing all the songs with Al. It's just, uh, I... I think it's beautiful. I think that's it's their part of keeping that music alive and uh, making sure new generations hear it um, and and just just the melodies and the music. It's it's beautiful. He's he's a wonderful guy. The last concert that I saw before all the shutdowns was Tony Bennett. Wow. And it was Valentine's Day 2020, and James Taylor is going to be less than a mile from where I am right now. And I'm thinking that he's going to be performing at uh, a, a, an outdoor amphitheater here. And I'm thinking that might be the first show back. So it's like, ah. that that feels right to me. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I would agree with you. In fact, I was checking out his tour um, to, to, to see when I want to go because I don't miss it. I don't miss his tours every year, you know, and he's been so gracious to me and uh, I've introduced him to my family. He's just, I mean, I'll send you a picture of, of just hugging him. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a dream. He's amazing. Um, and that would be great. I went to my first concert a couple of weeks ago in Nashville. I went to the Caleb fan awards it's it's like a um it's a great it's put on by k love and the the gracious people there um bill and brian invited me so i got to see them and it's just a great 
array of the top Christian bands and it's a fan of ones. And it was at the Grand Ole Opry and a um, wonderful concert. It was like things are back. It was the first concert in over a year and a half. What do you think of Nashville? Um, I think it's cool to visit. I don't know if I would <clears throat> want to live there because of the ocean. I love the ocean. Right. But it's a it's a booming town. It's the restaurants are great. Um, it's a, it's really alive. People are uh, very. It's a very social place, and so many of my friends move there, like an artist and producers. So, you know, it's it's fun because I just go to visit. I, I went for a week and I went to dinner every night <laughs> <laughs> and you can grab people together. It's like, okay, why don't you come and you come and everybody's, everybody's uh, cause it's a down home place. Everybody's ready to go out, <laughs> especially mm. after COVID. Well, so much of this interview, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, <laughs> Frank Sinatra, uh, he kissed you, you're hugging James Taylor. And I remember Al Schmidt, talking about something that it blew my mind. He said that he hugged Bob Dylan, which you don't think about somebody typically hugging Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> he did because Al is the greatest hugger ever. Huh. I mean, when Al puts his arm around you, you, he, he's so strong, you know, he like, he'll just hug you and he'll pat you and he'll be, it's like, it's, it's, it's like so amazing. So I'm sure Bob was like, you know, okay, he's smiling, but you better get used to it because this is going to be a daily thing, Bob. And he did. <laughs> yeah. Bob was, if Bob was really nice to have in the studio, it was kind of like, you know, an icon walking down the hall. It was crazy, you know, but he, he um, brought his uh, big uh, tour bus. We parked it in the upper parking lot so he could have a place to go get a break when he wanted to. And he'd go off and go into his, you know, take a break for a couple hours and come back. Yeah. Was there was, a different feeling, you know, Bob Dylan is somebody who uh, there's always a bit of mystery with Bob Dylan. Was it a yeah. different feeling when Bob Dylan is, is there at Capitol studios? Yeah. Yeah. With, with, you know, cause he still has to come down the hall and walk by people and people come <laughs> sometimes are walking by or walking out to lunch and going, Oh goodness. It's like Bob Dylan, you know? And, um, you know, but he was, he was very quiet to himself. He had um, someone with them, you know, walking in kind of have a, he had a, a like a hoodie on for a few times, and but um, I got to meet him. And at one time, we were all sitting in a uh, his manager Jeff and and Al, and I was sitting there, and Bob sat on the director's chair next to me, and we were talking about movies. And he was just normal. It was really funny. He, in fact, he was kidding with me about something. I said, "Really, you?" You, you thought that movie is, he goes, I was only kidding you. And I'm like, oh, okay. So he was nice. Um, I, I really was uh, loved to, to be able to get to know him and talk to him. Maybe he'll make another record at Capitol. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, I mean, he did, he did a bunch of, rec a few records with Al Schmidt. Right. Three. All those classics. Yeah. He did them all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh you know, those are those calls you get once in a lifetime that someone says, uh, I gotta, do you have time coming up? And it's like, yeah, when? And it's like, um, I need like a couple weeks. And, and I always go, um, when they say, I love it when they say, uh, can't really bring it, mention it right now. Huh. I'm like, great. I love those. <laughs> I can keep a secret too. So, you know, but it's like, you know, give me a hint. It's great. Well, we've we've mentioned already the the most legendary singers ever, you know, <laughs> Frank Sinatra, Bob Dylan, Paul McCartney, James Taylor. Who have you Tony not? Tony Bennett was a nice guy. Tony Who's that? Bennett. Tony, Tony Bennett was a oh, wonderful yeah. guy, just as polite as can be. <clears throat> and singing at his age still. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Music state keeps you young. Who have you not had come into Capitol Studios that you you it's been a dream to meet or you would really like for them to come in? Who who could you say maybe nobody has not come in there? Yeah, you know, I mean if we're talking about alive or deceased, hmm. you know, and um if if I'm gonna say who who would I wanna meet, probably it would be I can't meet someone that's already gone. So 
but I know it's going to sound weird, but Sophia Loren. Oh. Uh, and and I I had a connection, and I was talking to Diane Warren, who was just on her her eleventh nomination for Ill Soul, uh, the song from the movie um, just released recently, and Sophia Loren starred in it. Her her son directed it, and Diane wrote the song and. Uh, I was like, you got to meet her and hang out with her. I was like, oh, you know, because she's she's Italian. She's from near where my, um, you know, grandparents were from. And so I, she was just I know she doesn't sing, but she does sing. I've seen her in she, movies. Yeah, so, she did. Yeah. yeah. And um, it started in Naples. She sang. So, you know, maybe that'd be a dream come true someday. <laughs> I like that answer. Sophia Loren. <laughs> Well, you are a singer, and uh, not long ago, I got to hear the contribution you made to the Sound City documentary, and uh, I also, I was listening to that Don Cromwell show, and oh gosh, <laughs> they played these really cool uh, recordings of, of different versions of you singing, uh, I forget the, friends. that's it. Yeah. yeah, Janis Joplin thing. You know, it's it was really been a desire, you know, ever since I did want to play piano and sing after Carol King and, you know, Joni Mitchell. So when I came to California when I was 20, I said, you know, I never got my piano, so I'm going to start to learn music while I, you know, work. And uh, before I knew it, though, I was meeting the, the best in the world singers. I mean, it, I didn't have a chance to catch up. So... It's always been a hidden dream, and since then I've been around singers, and I'm like, oh, I could, I can't do that, I can't do that. So I kind of, you know, beat myself up a little about it. Um, but I always, you know, when I started working at Sound City, and people said, you know, you want to sing backgrounds, and I'm like, yeah, because I, I sang in the car, I heard myself sing, and I'm, so they gave me little background parts to uh, to learn. I never learned to read and write music when I came to Capital. Uh, someone. Uh, this uh, contractor, Joe Soldo, he heard something I sang on just for fun for a Christmas thing. And he goes, you got a great tone. He said, um, do you read? And I went, um, he goes, nah, forget it. I'm like, I guess if you really read music, you just say yes or no, not like, oh. <laughs> so, you know, that that's always what you guys But working in the professionality of the uh, music business, you don't really speak about it. And basically, you know, it was something that, that's why I, I never got jaded because I was like oh, they're singing they're doing they're doing it it's, and it sounds beautiful and you know so when um I always you know ran helping out with clubs or a little you know some weddings and stuff just anywhere I could get in to sing um, on the side and when Dave Grohl called me about uh, doing an interview for Sound City um I said to my friend Doug uh, the co-writer, I said, you know, I did this interview and I don't think anyone else is going to write a theme song about Sound City. Why don't we do it just for fun? Mm -hmm. So we, so many things rhyme, rhyme with city and we just sat there and he, he, he created a great melody and we came up with the, got it on two inch tape. And, uh, and I got invited about two weeks later after he, he rushed the song and I sang it um, in, you know, look at the iron irony. I'm running studios all these years and I sang it to, into a computer in his garage studio. <laughs> you know, oh. he did all the parts and uh, I thought, well, maybe I can go into the studio, <laughs> but um, you know, Dave invited me down and I, we, we played the CD. I got enough gumption up to just say, play it. And he said, cool. And then 10 months later, they, he said, you know, I'm putting the demo like, I'm like, oh, we're not going to do it over. So he said, I put the demo. It sounds like an end title. So that's, that was a dream come true. I said, I always want to get a song in a movie. I didn't know I had to live it. But hmm. it was uh, it was uh, such an honor. And uh, just to be like, here's a part of my life. And I got to write a song and sing it, you know. And I was with all my peers there. So that was incredible. Thank you, Dave Grohl. You know, he, he really did a lot for me. Do you write a fair amount? Not really. I have a friend that, that we wrote a, a couple of songs together, but, uh, uh, you know, just in spare time, just trying to come up with ideas, write lyrics, you know, that's that's a, um, something I, I should have, you know, even on the side pursuit. But, you know, when like 
you know, all those years, uh, I could have been studying guitar and piano. I have enough of them. I have a piano. I have a couple of guitars, you know, but it's just, you know, I think I'm intimidated by the greatness um, that is all around me. And, you know, one time when I was older, my dad said to me, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't get your piano, but that's your love. And and I said, you know, dad, if, if uh, you did, I might have like had a quick rise and fall and then ran home. I said, but since my love of and passion of music uh, got so strong and I found a way to be around it without having to uh, perform, you know, it, it was like I didn't even know about recording studios till I went down with my friend Vinnie Poncia, who produced Melissa Manchester, he, I got invited to a session and I, that was the first time I saw a studio. And that first time I saw that there was an office, office uh, connected to a studio. So that started the whole like, wow, I could, I could be around it. So I stuck around. <laughs> is there a song that is particularly meaningful to you? Um, Gosh, that is a well. That that's a that's a tough one um, because I love so many. Um, you know, I I love the songs like like James Taylor and Joni Mitchell, and you know I love the Doobies, and um, and then I love all the the big band records. You know, so it's really hard to pinpoint that. That took me by surprise that question. So I don't really. <laughs> If it comes to you, let me know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. What is the best place to eat near Capitol Studios? Well, my vote is for Marino's, which is right down on Vine, um, just on uh, Melrose. Um, it's uh, an Italian family. His dad used to run Martoni's, which was the the Coanga and Sunset Hang of all music business. I think Sinatra used to go there. So him and his brother had this Martoni's. And then they split up and he went down and had Marino's. And um, so since I started working at Capitol 30 years ago, I was going there and Al loved it. And uh, the two sons have taken it over since he passed away and they're still making a wonderful food. So that is the best right around Capitol to run down to in my in my eyes. What do you suggest there? Um, the um, aliolio, which is just pasta with uh, olive oil and uh, garlic. Um, they have another um, called uh, Polo Vesuvio. It's a chicken dish. <laughs> if I'm there, yes, I, I'm going to, I'm going to go. <laughs> See you and Robert. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be I, nice. I, I've gone there a lot with Robert. He loves it too. Okay. <laughs> Is there a favorite compliment that you have received? Well, of course the Frank that I just told you about. Um, the uh, other one is uh, Al, who said I was his day wife and it was blessed by his <laughs> wife. She says it too. She goes, you were his day wife. So that was such a huge compliment. Um, but one of the really special compliments I received, which was, <laughs> I always said that's the best compliment, was uh, we were doing a record with Rob Galbraith and um, Al was working on it and for Ronnie Misla. Mis Ronnie Mislap, Millsap, Ronnie Mislap, Millsap, oh. the country singer, the blind country singer. And uh, Rob brought me over to meet him and he shook my hand and he goes, Paula, he goes, they told me if I could see for a few seconds, you'd be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I, um, I almost dropped to my knees. I said, wow. I said, oh my God, thank you. What a, what a compliment. That is so special. So. Nice. I said, I bet you say that to all the girls. No kidding. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was, uh, I just, it, I'll never forget that. That was amazing. Hmm. So. What would you say you're proudest of? Uh, I'm, I'm proud that um, I um, stuck it out. You know, I, I'm proud. I'm proud that, you know, I was encouraged to pursue a dream and um, that I stuck it out and I didn't run away when times get tough because times can get really tough. You know, I got, a, I got a lot of faith in God. So that helps me through it, but you know, times, times get really tough and you can give up. So I'm really proud um, that I, be, I was able to become a mainstay in the business 
And um, I'm, I'm proud that uh, I, I kept my integrity and my work ethic in, in, in check. Um, and, um, you know, just being a positive force and spreading, uh, you know, love and inspiration as much as I can. But I'm very proud at, um, that uh, with Capitals, help and Maureen Schultz and people from the Hollywood chamber that I was able to uh, get out uh, a Hollywood Walk of Fame star right in mm. front of Capitol because uh, that was a job in itself to get it done and uh, it was uh, a joy to, to reach out to everybody and see the love and and then have Al uh, be just beaming that day and it's a family uh, legacy and uh, it'll always be there so that's uh, was this a crowning um achievement if ever that I was really blessed to be a part of. So who is Paula Salvatore at heart? How do you define yourself? I'm an Italian girl from Rhode Island. <laughs> you know, I I um I try to keep myself in check. I don't think I've changed too much. I still have friends back there and my whole family's back there. So I just think I'm uh you know uh a, a normal girl that that uh, got some adventure spirit in me uh, that led me to all the musical highways. And, um, you know, like I tell people, if you don't do it while you're 20, you might not do it because you are almost blindly brave. And um, uh, so that that's the only thing that sometimes differs from a lot of people, you know, is that, you know, you realize your love and your passion early in life and, and um, you know, took took the chance and uh, risk to do it because you know coming three thousand miles without family is is you know it, it it's kind of rough. I mean, there's a lot of rough times I can remember, but I see that as growth. Uh, you know, you have to look at what you've been through as part of your story. Well, Paula, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you for this this very passionate, very interesting interview. Wow. Thank you. You know how to ask the right questions. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> really. It's, uh, it was really interesting. And thank you because it really, uh, you know, it, it, it makes me um, honored and appreciative of um, what, what I've gotten the chance to live through, you know, kind of blows my mind sometimes, but, you know, I don't like to be just a name dropper, but that's kind of what being in entertainment is about. Right. <laughs> Being That's around. True. And everybody likes to hear it for a minute, you know, but it's it's fun. It's fun. Sure. I'd love to share. I'd love to share. You have great stories and it's a very inspiring one at, at oh, also. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I'd like to make a shout out to uh uh, Patrick Krause and Michael Fry and um, my su supervisors at Capitol that have uh, stood by me a lot of years and, and gave me this new, uh, with UMG, uh, gave me this new direction and promotion to further service uh, the clients and have a part of uh, the studio growth that they're doing. Well, since you gave a shout out, I wanted to acknowledge for just a moment, since you did it, I get to do it. I have to acknowledge the interviews that I used in terms of my research. So I'll give a shout out to the uh, Signal Path by Sure. That was one I listened to. Also, Terry Woolman and Dom Cromwell Live. Thank you so much. Love that. Give credit where credit Proud is due. People. Yes. <laughs> yes. We are good at that. That's great. That's what you got to do. Amen. <laughs> All right, Paula. Until next time. Yes. Thank you, Paul. That was a lovely, lovely time. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Till next time. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.